In the Teeth of the Evidence, a Lord Peter Wimsey story, by Dorothy L. Sayers. Well, old son, said Mr. Lampluff, and what can we do for you today? Oh, some of your wispy anglers, as I suppose, said Lord Peter Wimsey, seating himself resentfully in the green velvet torture chair and making a face in the direction of the drill. Jolly old left hand up a grinder come to bits on me. I was only eating an omelette, too. I can't understand why they always pick these moments. If I'd been cracking nuts or chewing peppermint jumbles, I, I couldn't understand it. Yes, said Mr. Lampluff soothingly. He drew an electric bulb, complete with mirror, as though by magic, out of a kind of masculine and avant contraption on Lord Peter's left. A trail of flags followed it, issuing apparently from the bowels of the earth. Any pain? No pain, said Whimsy irritably, unless you count a sharp edge fit to saw your tongue off. Point is, why should it go pop like that? I wasn't doing anything to it. No, said Mr. Lampluff, his manner hovering between the professional and the friendly for he was an old Winchester man, and a member of one of Wimsey's clubs, and had frequently met him on the cricket field in the days of their youth. Well, if you'll stop talking half a moment, we'll have a look at it. Ah, don't say ah like that, as if you found pyrrhea and your roses of the jaw and were gloating over it, you damned old ghoul. Just carve it out and stop it up and be hanged to you. And by the way, what have you been up to? Why should I meet an inspector of police on your doorstep? You needn't pretend he came to have his bridge work attended to, because I saw his sergeant waiting for him outside. Well, it was rather curious, said Mr. Lampluff, dexterously gagging his friend with one hand and dabbing cotton wool into the offending cavity with the other. I suppose I oughtn't tell you, but if I don't, you'll get it out of all your friends at Scotland Yard. They wanted to see my predecessor's books. Possibly you noticed that bit in the papers about a dental man being found dead in a blazing garage in Wimbledon Common. Yonker, said Lord Peter Wimsey. Last night, said Mr. Lampluff, pooped off about nine per pema, and it took them three hours to put it out. One of those wooden garages, and the big job was to keep the blaze away from the house. Fortunately, it's the end of the row, with nobody at home. Apparently, this man Prendergast was all alone there, just going off for a holiday or something, and he contrived to set himself in his car in his garage alight last night and was burned to death. In fact, when they found him, he was so badly charred that they couldn't be sure it was he. So, being sticklers for routine, they had a look at his teeth. Oh, yes, said Whimsy, watching Mr. Lampluff fitting a new drill into his socket. Didn't anybody have a go at putting the fire out? Oh, yes, but as it was a wooden shed full of petrol, it simply went up like a bonfire. Just a little bit over this way, please. That's splendid. Grr, whiz, grr. As a matter of fact, they seem to think it might just possibly be suicide. The man's married with three children, and a mirror and all that sort of thing. Whiz, grr, burr, grr, whiz. His family is down at Worthing, staying with his mother-in-law or something. Uh, tell me if I hurt you. Grr. And I don't suppose he was doing any too well. Still, of course, he may easily have had an accident when filling up. I gather he was starting off that night to join them. Uh, 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 inquired Whimsy, naturally enough. How do I come into it? said Mr. Lampluff, who, from long experience, was expert in the interpretation of mumblings. Well, only because the chap whose practice I took over here did this fellow Prendergast's dental work for him. Whiz. He died, but left his books behind him for my guidance, in case any of his old patients should feel inclined to trust me. Grr, whiz, I'm sorry, did you feel that? As a matter of fact, some of them actually do. I suppose it's an instinct to trundle round to the same old place when you're in pain, like the dying elephants. Uh, will you rinse, please? I see, said Whimsy, when he had finished washing out chips of himself and exploring his ravaged molar with his tongue. Now, what it is that these cavities always seem so large. I feel as if I could put my head into this one. Uh, still, I suppose you know what you're about. And are plenty of teeth all right? Haven't had time to hunt down the ledger yet, but I've said I'll go down to have a look at them as soon as I've finished with you. It's my lunchtime, anyway, and my two o'clock patient isn't coming, thank goodness. She usually brings five spoiled children, and they all want to sit around and watch and play with the apparatus. One of them got loose last time and tried to electrocute itself on the X-ray plant next door, and she thinks the children should be done at half price. Uh, a little wider, if you can manage it. Grr. Yes, it's very nice. Now we can dress that and put in a temporary uh, rinse, please. Yes, said Whimsy. For goodness sake, make it firm and not too much of your foul oil of cloves. I didn't want bits to come out in the middle of dinner. You can't imagine the nastiness of caviar flavoured with cloves. No, 
said Mr. Lampluff. "'You may find this a little cold. Squirt, squish. Rinse, please. Uh, you may notice it when the dressing goes in. Oh, you did notice it. Good. That shows that the nerve's all right. Only a little longer now. There. Yes, you may get done now. Another rinse, certainly. Uh, when would you like to come in again? Don't be a silly old horse, said Whimsy. I'm coming out to Wimbledon with you straight away. Uh, you'll get there twice as fast as I drive you. I've never had a corpse in a blazing garage before, and I want to learn. There is nothing really attractive about corpses and blazing garages. Even Whimsy's war experience did not quite reconcile him to the object that lay on the mortuary slab in the police station. Charred out of all resemblance to humanity, it turned even the police surgeon pale, while Mr. Lampluff was so overcome that he had to lay down the books he had brought with him, and retired into the open to recover himself. Meanwhile, Whimsy, having put himself on terms of mutual confidence and esteem with the police officials, thoughtfully turned over the little pile of black and and ends that represented the contents of Mr. Prendergast's pockets. There was nothing remarkable about them. The leather note case still held the remains of a thickish wad of notes, doubtless cash in hand for the holiday at Worthing. The handsome gold watch, obviously a presentation, had stopped at seven minutes past nine. Whimsy remarked on its good state of preservation. Sheltered between the left arm and the body, that seemed to the explanation. Looks as though the first sudden blaze had regularly overcome him, said the police inspector. He evidently made no attempt to get out. He'd simply fallen forward over the wheel, with his head on the dashboard. That's why the face was so disfigured. I'll show you the remains of the car presently, if you're interested, my lord. If the other gentleman's feeling better, we may as well take you to the body first. Taking the body was a long and unpleasant job. Mr. Lampluff, nerving himself with an effort and producing a pair of forceps and a probe, went gingerly over the jaws, reduced almost to their bony structure by the furnace heat to which they had been exposed, while a police surgeon checked entries in the ledger. Mr. Prendergast had a dental history extending back over ten years in the ledger, and had already had two or three fillings done before that time. These had been noted at the time when he first came to Mr. Lampluff's predecessor. At the end of a long examination, a surgeon looked up from the notes he had been making. "'Well, now,' he said, "'let's check that again. Allowing for renewal of old work, I think we've got a pretty accurate picture of the present state of his mouth. There ought to be nine fillings in all. Small amalgam filling in the lower back wisdom tooth, big amalgam ditto in right lower back molar, amalgam fillings in right upper first and second bicuspids at point of contact, right up incise of crown, that all right?' "'I expect so,' said Mr. Lambluff, "'except that the right upper incisor seems to be missing altogether, uh, "'but possibly the crown came loose and fell out.' "'He probed delicately. Uh, "'The jaw is very brittle. I can't make anything of the canal. "'But there's nothing against it. "'We may find the crown in the garage,' suggested the inspector. "'Fused porcelain filling in left upper canine,' went on the surgeon. "'Amalgam fillings in left upper first bicuspid and lower second bicuspid "'and left lower thirteen-year-old molar.' It seems to be all. No teeth missing and no artificials. How old was this man, Inspector? About forty-five, Doc. My age. I only wish I had as good a set of teeth, said the surgeon. Mr. Lampluff agreed with him. Then I take it this is Mr. Prendergast, all right, said the Inspector. Not a doubt of it, I should say, replied Mr. Lampluff, though I should like to find that missing crown. We'd better get round to the house, then, said the Inspector. Well, yes, thank you, my lord. I shouldn't mind a lift in that. Some car. Uh, we'll... The only point now is whether it was accident or suicide. Uh, round to the right, my lord, and then second on the left. I'll tell you as we go. A bit out of the way for a dental man, observed Mr. Lampluff, as they emerged upon some scattered houses near the common. The inspector made a grimace. I thought the same, sir, but it appears Mrs. Prendergast persuaded him to come here. So good for the children. Not so good for the practice, though. If you ask me, I should say Mrs. P was the biggest argument we have for suicide. Uh, here we are. The last sentence was scarcely necessary. There was a little crowd about the gate of a small detached villa at the end of a row of similar houses. From a pile of dismal debris in the garden, a smell of burning still rose disgustingly. The inspector pushed through the gate with his companions, pursued by the comments of the bystanders. "'That's the inspector. That's Dr. Maggs. There'll be another doctor with him with a little bag. Who's that bloke in the eyeglass? Looks a proper nobleman, don't he, Flory? Why, he'll be the insurance bloke. Cool, look at his grand car.' "'It's where the money goes. "'It's a rose, that is. "'No, silly, it's a Daimler. "'Oh, well, it's all advertisement these days.' "'Whimsy giggled indecorously all about the garden path. "'The sight of the skeleton car amid the sodden and fire-blackened remains of the garage sobered him. Two police constables, crouched over the ruin with a sieve, stood up and saluted. "'How are you getting on, Jenkins?' 
haven't got anything much yet, sir, bar an ivory cigarette holder. Uh, this gentleman, indicating a stout, bald man in spectacles, who was squatting among the damaged coachwork, is Mr. Tolley from the motor works, come with a note from the superintendent, sir. Ah, yes. Uh, can you give any opinion about this, Mr. Tolley? Mr. Meggs, you know, Mr. Lampluff, Lord Peter Whimsey. By the way, Jenkins, Mr. Lampluff has been going into the corpse's dentistry, and he's looking for a lost tooth. Uh, you may see if you can find it. Now, Mr. Tolley? <clears throat> Can't see much doubt about how it happened, said Mr. Tolley, picking his teeth thoughtfully. Regular death traps, these little saloons, when anything goes wrong unexpectedly. There's a front tank, you see, and it looks as though there might possibly have been a bit of a leak behind the dash somewhere. Possibly the seam of the tank had got strained a bit, or the union had come loose. It's loose now, as a matter of fact, but that's not unusual after a fire. Rouse case or no rouse case. Uh, you can get quite a lot of slow dripping from a damaged tank or pipe, and there seems to have been a coconut mat around the controls, which would prevent you from noticing. There'd be a smell, of course, while these little garages do often get to smell of petrol, and it kept several cans of the stuff here, uh, more than a legal amount, uh, but that's not unusual either. Looks to me as though he'd filled up his tank. There are two empty tins near the bonnet, with the caps loose. Uh, got in, shut the door, started the car, perhaps, and then lit a cigarette. Then, if there were any petrol fumes about from a leak, the whole show would go up in his face. Whoosh! How was the ignition? Off! He may never have switched it on, but it's quite likely he switched it off again when the flames went up. Silly thing to do, but lots of people do do it. The proper thing, of course, is to switch off the petrol and leave the engine running so as to empty the carburetor. But you don't always think straight when you're being burned alive. Or he may have meant to turn off the petrol and been overcome before he could manage it. Uh, the tank's over here to the left, you see. On the other hand, said Whimsy, he may have committed suicide and faked the accident. Nasty way of committing suicide. Suppose he'd taken poison first. You'd have to stay alive long enough to fire the car. That's true. Suppose he shot himself, with a flash from the... No, that's silly. Uh, you, you ought to find the weapon in that case. Or a hypodermic. Same rejection. Mm, prussic acid might have done it. I mean, he must have just had time to take a tablet and then fire the car. Prussic acid's pretty quick, but it isn't absolutely instantaneous. I'll have a look for it anyway, said Dr. Maggs. They were interrupted by the constable. Excuse me, sir, but I think we found the tooth. Uh, Mr. Lempworth says this is it. Between his pudgy finger and thumb he held up a small, bony object, from which a small stalk of metal still protruded. "'That's a right up in size of crown, all right, by the look of it,' said Mr. Lampluff. "'I suppose the cement gave way with the heat. Some cements are sensitive to heat, some, on the other hand, to damp. Well, that settles it, doesn't it?' "'Yes. Well, we shall have to break it to the widow. Not that she can be in very much doubt, I imagine.' Mrs. Plendergast, a very much made-up lady with a face set in lines of habitual peevishness, received the news of the burst of large sobs. She informed them, when she was sufficiently recovered, that Arthur had always been careless about petrol, that he smoked too much, that she had often warned him about the danger of small saloons, that she had told him he ought to get a bigger car, that the one he had was not really large enough for her and the whole family, that he would drive at night, though she had always said it was dangerous, and that if he'd listened to her it would never have happened. Poor Arthur was not a good driver. Only last week, when he was taking us down to Worthing, he drove the car right up on a bank and trying to pass a lorry and frighten us all dreadfully. Ah, said the inspector, no doubt that's how the tank got strained. Very cautiously, he inquired whether Mr. Prendergast could have had any reason for taking his own life. The widow was indignant. It was true that the practice had been declining of late, but Arthur would never have been so wicked as to do such a thing. Why, only three months ago, he had taken out a life insurance for five hundred pounds, and he'd never have invalidated it by committing suicide within the term stipulated by the policy. Inconsiderate of her as Arthur was, and whatever injury he had done her as a wife, he wouldn't rob his innocent children. The inspector pricked up his ears at the word injuries. What injuries? No, oh, well, of course, she'd known all the time that Arthur was carrying on with that Mrs. Fielding. You couldn't deceive her with all this stuff about teeth needing continual attention. And it was all very well to say that Mrs. Fielding's house was better run than her own. That wasn't surprising. A rich widow with no children and no responsibilities, of course she could afford to have everything nice. You couldn't expect a busy wife to do miracles on such a small housekeeping allowance. If Arthur had wanted things different, he should have been more generous. And it was easy enough for Mrs. Fielding to attract men dressed up like a fashion pate, you know better than she should be. She'd told Arthur that if it didn't stop, she'd divorce him. And since then he'd taken to spending all his evenings in town, and what he was doing there, 
The inspector stemmed the torrent by asking for Mrs. Fielding's address. "'I am sure I don't know,' said Mrs. Prendergast. "'She did live at number 57, but she went abroad after I made it clear I wasn't going to stand any more of it. It's very nice to be some people with plenty of money to spend. I've never been abroad since our honeymoon, and that was only to Bologna.' At the end of this conversation, the inspector sought Dr. Maggs and begged him to be thorough in his search for prussic acid. The remaining testimony was that of Gladys, the general servant. She had left Mr. Prendergast's house the day before at six o'clock. She was to have taken a week's holiday while the Prendergasts were at Worthing. She had thought that Mr. Prendergast had seemed worried and nervous the last few days, but that had not surprised her, because she knew he disliked staying with his wife's people. She, Gladys, had finished her work and put out a cold supper, and then gone home with that employer's permission. He had a patient, a gentleman from Australia or some such place, who wanted his teeth attending to in a hurry before going off on his travels again. Mr. Prendergast explained that he would be working late and would shut out the house himself, and she need not wait. Further inquiry showed that Mr. Prendergast had scarcely touched his supper, being presumably in a hurry to get off. Apparently, then, the patient had been the last person to see Mr. Prendergast alive. The dentist's appointment book was next examined. The patient figured there as Mr. Williams, 5.30, and the address book placed Mr. Williams at a small hotel in Bloomsbury. The manager of the hotel said that Mr. Williams had stayed there for a week. He had given no address except Adelaide, and had mentioned that he was revisiting the old country for the first time after twenty years, and had no friends in London. Unfortunately, he could not be interviewed. At about half-past ten the previous night, a messenger had called, bringing his card to pay his bill and remove his luggage. No address had been left for forwarding letters. It was not a district messenger, but a man in a slouch hat and a heavy dark overcoat. The night porter had not seen his face very clearly, as only one light was on in the hall. He had told them to hurry up as Mr. Williams wanted to catch the boat train from Waterloo. Inquiry at the booking office showed that a Mr. Williams had actually travelled on that train, being booked to Paris. The ticket had been taken that same night. So Mr. Williams had disappeared into the blue, and even if they could trace him, it seemed unlikely that he could throw much light on Mr. Prendergast's state of mind immediately previous to the disaster. It seemed a little odd, at first, that Mr. Williams, from Adelaide, staying in Bloomsbury, should have travelled to Wimbledon to get his teeth attended to, but the simple explanation was the likeliest, namely that the friendless Williams had struck up an acquaintance with Prendergast in a café or some such place, and that a casual mention of his dental necessities had led to a project of mutual profit and assistance after which nothing seemed to be left but for the coroner to bring in a verdict of death by misadventure, and for the widow to send in her claim to the insurance company, when Dr. Maggs upset the whole scheme of things by announcing that he had discovered traces of a large injection of hyacinth in the body, and what about it? The inspector, on hearing this, observed carelessly that he was not surprised. If ever a man had an excuse for suicide, he thought it was Mrs. Prendergast's husband. He thought that it would be desirable to make a careful search amongst the scorched laurels surrounding what had been Mr. Prendergast's garage. Lord Peter Wimsey agreed, but committed himself to the prophecy that the syringe would not be found. Lord Peter Wimsey was entirely wrong. The syringe was found the next day, and a physician suggesting that it had been thrown out of the window of the garage after use. Traces of the poison were discovered to be present in it. "'It's a slow-working drug,' observed Dr. Maggs. No doubt he jabbed himself, threw the syringe away, hoping that it would never be looked for, and then, before he lost consciousness, climbed into the car and set light to it. A clumsy way of doing it. A damned ingenious way of doing it, said Wimsey. I didn't believe in that syringe somehow. He rang up his dentist. Lamplough, old horse, he said. I wish you'd do something for me. I wish you'd go over those teeth again. No, not my teeth, the Prendergast's. Oh, blow it, said Mr. Lamplough uneasily. No, but I wish you would, said his lordship. The body was still unburied. Mr. Lamplough, grumbling very much, went down to Wimbledon with Wimsey, and again went through his distasteful task. This time he started on the left side. Lower thirteen-year-old Mola and second biscuit bed filled amalgam. Uh, the fire's got it there's a bit. They're all right. First up a biscuit bed. Biscuit bed's a steward sort of teeth. Always the first to go. Uh, that filling looks to have been rather carelessly put in. Not what I should call good work. It seems to extend over the next tools. Possibly the fire in there. Left up a canine, cast porcelain, filling on anterior face. Half a jiff, said Wimsey. Mag's note says, fused porcelain. Is it the same thing? No, different process. Well, I suppose it's fused porcelain. Difficult to see. I should have said it was cast myself, but that's as may be. Let's verify it in the ledger. I wish Mag would put the dates in. Goodness knows how far back I shall have to hunt. And I don't understand this chap's writing on his dashed abbreviations. 
You won't have to go very far back if it's cast. The stuff only came in about 1928 from America. Uh, there was quite a range for it then, but for some reason it didn't take on extraordinarily well over here. But some menu was it? Oh, then it isn't cast, said Whimsy. There's nothing here about canines back to 28. Let's make sure. Uh, 27, 26, 25, 24, 23. Here you are, uh, canine. Something or other. That's it, said Lampluff, coming to look over his shoulder. Fused porcelain. I must be wrong, then. Easily see by taking it out. The grain's different, and so is the way it's put in. How different? Well, said Mr. Lampluff, one's a cast, you see, and the other's fused. I did grasp that much. Well, go ahead and take it out. Can't very well, not here. Then take it home and do it there. Don't you see, Lampluff, how important it is? If it is cast porcelain, or whatever you call it, it can't be done in twenty-three. And if it was removed later, then another dentist must have done it. And he may have done other things. In that case, those things ought to be there, and they're not. Did you see? I see you're getting rather agitated, said Mr. Lamluff. All I can say is, I refuse to have this thing taken along to my surgery. Corpses aren't popular in Harley Street. In the end, the body was removed, by permission, to the dental department of the local hospital. Here, Mr. Lamluff, assisted by the staff dental expert, Dr. Maggs, and the police, delicately extracted the filling from the canine. If that, he said triumphantly, is not cast porcelain, I will extract all my own teeth without an anaesthetic and swallow them. What do you say, Bentham? The hospital dentist agreed with him. Mr. Lampluff, who had suddenly developed an eager interest in the problem, nodded and inserted a careful probe between the upper right biscuits with their adjacent fillings. Come and look at this, Bentham. Allowing for the action of the fire and all this muck, wouldn't you have said that this was a very recent filling? There, to the point of contact. Might have been done yesterday, and here, wait a minute. Where's the lad jaw gone to? Get that fitted up. Uh, give me a bit of carbon. Uh, look at the tremendous bite there ought to be here, with that big molar coming down onto it. That feeling's miles too high for the job. Whimsy, when was this bottom right-hand back molar filled? Two years ago, said Whimsy. That's impossible, said the two dentists together. And Mr. Benton added, If you clear away the mess, you'll see it's a new filling. Never been bitten on, I should say. Look here, Mr. Lampluff, there's something odd here. Odd? I should say there was. I never thought about it when I was checking it out yesterday. But look at this old cavity and the lateral here. Why didn't he have that filled when all this other work was done? Now it's cleaned out. You can see it plainly. Have you got a long probe? It's quite deep. It must have given him jib. I say, Inspector, I want to have some of these fillings out. Do you mind? Go ahead, said the Inspector. We've got plenty of witnesses. With Mr. Benton supporting the grizzly patient and Mr. Lampluff manipulating the drill, the filling of one of the molars was speedily drilled out, and Mr. Lampluff said, Oh, gosh! Which, as Lord Peter remarked, just showed you what a dentist meant when he said, Ah! Try the biscuits, suggested Mr. Benton. Or this thirteen-year-old, chimed in his colleague. Hold on, gentlemen, protested the inspector. Don't spoil the specimen altogether. Mr. Lampluff drilled away without heeding him. Another filling came out, and Mr. Lampluff said, "'Gosh, again. "'It's all right,' said Whimsy, grinning. "'You can get out your warrant, Inspector. "'What's that, my lord?' "'Murder,' said Whimsy. "'Why?' said the Inspector. "'Do these gentlemen mean that Mr. Prendergast got a new dentist "'who poisoned his teeth for him?' "'No,' said Mr. Lamluff. "'At least not what you mean by poisoning. "'But I've never seen such work in my life. "'Why, in two places the man hasn't even troubled to clear out the decay at all. "'He's just enlarged the cavity and stopped it up again anyhow.' Why, this chap didn't get thundering abscesses, I don't know. Perhaps, said Whimsy, the stoppings were put in too recently. Hello, what now? This one's all right. No decay here. Doesn't look as if there ever had been, either. But one can't tell about that. I dare say there never was. Get a warrant out, Inspector, for the murder of Mr. Prendergast, and against whom? No, against Arthur Prendergast for the murder of one Mr. Williams, and, incidentally, for arson and attempted fraud. And against Mrs. Fielding, too, if you like, for conspiracy. They may be able to prove that part of it. It turned out, when they found Mr. Prendergast in Rouen, that he had thought out the scheme well in advance. The one thing that he had had to wait for had been to find a patient of his own height and build, with a good set of teeth and few home ties. When the unhappy Williams had fallen into his clutches, he had few preparations to make. Mrs. Prendergast had to be packed off to Worthing, a journey she was ready enough to take at any time, and the maid given a holiday. Then the necessary dental accessories had to be prepared, and the victim invited out to tea at Wimbledon. Then the murder, a stunning blow from behind, followed by an injection. Then the slow and horrid process of faking the teeth to correspond with Mr. Prendergast's own. 
Next, the exchange of clothes and the body carried down and placed in the car. The hypodermic put where it might be overlooked on a casual inspection, and yet might plausibly be found if the presence of the drug should be discovered, ready in the one case to support a verdict for accident, and in the second of suicide. Then the car soaked in petrol, the union loosened, the cans left about, the garage door and the window left open to lend colour to the story and provide a draught, and finally light set to the car by means of a train of petrol laid through the garage door. Then flight to the station through the winter darkness, and so by underground to London. The risk of being recognised on the underground was small, in William's hat and clothes and with a scarf wound about the lower part of the face. The next step was to pick up William's luggage and take the boat train to join the wealthy and enamoured Mrs. Fielding in France, after which Williams and Mrs. Williams could have returned to England, or not, as they pleased. "'Quite a student of criminology,' remarked Whimsy at the conclusion of this little adventure. "'He'd studied rules and furnace, all right, and profited by their mistakes. Petty overlooked the matter of the cast porcelain. Makes a quicker job, doesn't it, Lamloff? Well, more haste, less speed. I do wonder, though, at what point of the proceedings Williams actually died. Shut up, said Mr. Lamloff. And by the way, I've still got to finish that filling for you. Mm.